and welcome to Comics Crash Course. So last week I talked about the people who helped make comics, but after yapping at you for about 10 minutes, I told you you should forget all about them. So what was I on about? Well, whenever I teach anything, a book, a movie, a comic, and I'm talking about the text with my students, one question inevitably arises. Is that what the author meant to say? Well, at the end of the 1960s, two French critics wrote hugely influential essays addressing this very subject. Roland Barthes' The Death of the Author first appeared in 1967, while Michel Foucault delivered the lecture that inspired his essay, What is an Author?, in 1969. Uh, they're both pretty similar, uh, but I'm going to spend most of this video talking about Barthes' text because, well, I like it better. Anyway, so Barthes sees this tendency to focus on what the author means to say as a problem. He writes, the explanation of a work is always sought in the man or woman who produced it, as if it were always in the end, through the more or less transparent allegory of the fiction, the voice of a single person, the author confiding in us. Now, I totally get the desire to know what the author meant to say. You see, when we say something, we want to know that we'll be understood, that our message will be received. But there's no guarantee. We can't force the person we're talking to to understand what we mean, no matter how hard we try. And if they misunderstand us, well, we can't undo that first mistake. It's just not how communication works. And with texts, which are non-direct forms of communication, well, the whole thing gets trickier because the author isn't just standing there to say, but what I really meant to say was, even if they write a paragraph or introduction trying to do that, critics knew it was dangerous to assume you could ever know what an author meant to say. Wimsett and Beardsley coined the term intentional fallacy, which you might have heard, in 1946 to describe the relatively common assumption that an author's stated intention was the only correct way to understand a text. You see, people can lie, or they don't know the full extent of what they do mean, or all of the implications of what they might say. And on top of that, as I mentioned earlier, texts aren't direct messages. They have many layers and many possible meanings. And yet, to quote Barthes, to give a text an author, and with that author some hidden single meaning, is to impose a limit on a text. Now, this might seem to make things easier to impose limits, but it's ultimately a false sense of security. So then, how do we find the real meaning of a text? Well. We don't, because there isn't one. There are many possible meanings. In fact, when I say understanding or meaning, I'm kind of using the wrong words. I like the poetry of Barth's efforts to describe his attempts to navigate this wealth of meaning always already present in the text. In the multiplicity of writing, everything is to be disentangled, nothing deciphered. The structure can be followed, run, like the thread of a stocking, at every point and at every level, but there is nothing beneath. The space of writing is to be ranged over, not pierced. You see, the moment we think to ourselves, ha, I've solved it, not only are we tricking ourselves, we're doing a disservice to the text as well. We're systematically closing off possibilities rather than allowing the text to exist in its full, even frightening, potentiality. So. What's the point of anything? How do we stop something from meaning anything or everything? Well, we look inward. For Barthes, the real creator of meaning in a text is the reader, not the author. Quote, the reader is the space on which all the quotations that make up a writing are inscribed without any of them being lost. A text's unity lies not in its origin, but in its destination. And while this seems heady and abstract, we see the effects of it every day. So imagine two people are having an argument. Person A says something to person B. And person B says, hey, that hurt my feelings. Person A says, well, I didn't mean it that way. But no matter how much person B understands that person A didn't mean to hurt their feelings, person B's feelings aren't unhurt. So. Was it a failure of interpretation on person B's part? Or a failure of communication on person A's part? Or was it not 
really a failure at all, just the outcome of the way that language works sometimes. Here's another brief example. I have written for you a text. These two little words can mean a lot in English. It technically means someone is doing well, but depending on the tone of voice, um, it can mean pretty much any other emotion, often in the opposite direction. It can refer to physical and emotional well-being or to physical attractiveness. Uh, the two words on your screen tell you nothing about what they mean, no matter how I meant to use them. The meaning you make of them ultimately will come out of you more than out of anything that I meant to say. Now, most authors are going to give you more to work with than I just did. And this is where we have to think about how the philosophical stakes of Barth's claim rub up against the practical realities of reality. After all, there would be no text without an author in the first place. Thus, I tend to think of text as a point of conversation in which the author's voice is one of many possible voices. Speaking of many voices, the relationship of meaning and creators is already messed up in comics because of the collaborative nature of the form. Because even if one person is taking on all of the possible roles, doing the writing, the penciling, the inking, the coloring, and all that kind of thing, they're still working and creating meaning in many possible modes, which means more possibilities for meaning to get tangled. Now, all of this said, I think we need to be careful before we throw away the author completely. You see, texts are created by human beings, and that means that they are the products both of individuals and of particular social, cultural, historical, political moments. So to kill the author completely is to forgo some of our best clues to the context in which a particular text is created. And while it's true that the context of the reader is also a huge factor, your cultural, political, social, historical, religious, etc. context will affect how you respond to a text, it can be really interesting to understand how those contexts affected the creation of a text in the first place. I talk about this in much more depth in episode 21, Why History Matters. So, why am I taking the time to talk about all of this now? Well, as we get into the nitty-gritty of formal theory, it's inevitable. When I talk about the shape and size of a panel and how it might affect meaning, or the choice of a particular color and how it might affect a reader, or the body of a particular line and how it might change your opinion of a character, it's going to come up. Aren't you thinking about this too hard? Did the artist even mean to do that? What I'm telling you now is simple. It doesn't matter if they meant to do it or not. Once it's on the page, it's done. It's the readers to play with. The work of the writer, the penciler, the inker, the letter, the colorist, and anyone else involved is important for us to recognize as individual work. But we as readers and critics are free from the tyranny of having to think about what those creators meant to say. The meaning that you received is one of the many possible meanings a text can hold, whether it was intended to be that way or not, which is actually really cool. And besides, your reaction probably didn't come out of the blue. After a quick foray next week into some more comics-related vocabulary, over the next few weeks, I'm going to start our formal discussion by introducing the elements of visual rhetoric. It's pretty powerful stuff. I'll see you then. I hope you've been enjoying Comics Crash Course. If you'd like to help us out, I encourage you to click like, to tell your friends to check out our channel, and as always, to hit subscribe.